Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Joint Glyconet ACS Carbohydrate Division Seminar. Um, it is my incredible pleasure to introduce Dr. and Professor Warren Wackerchuk, who is actually the current scientific director of Glyconet. Dr. Wackerchuk received his PhD in microbiology from the University of British Columbia, and then he was a research officer at the National Research Council in Canada for 19 years before taking a position in 2012 um, as a professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biology at Ryerson University in Toronto. In 2019, he moved from Ryerson to the University of Alberta, where he is currently Currently my colleague, as well as being scientific director of the Glyconet. Uh, the Wackerchip lab is known for investigating the structure and function of the enzymes which make and degrade glycoconjugates, and have really been using those to do protein engineering um, of drugs. And I'm really excited to look and looking forward to his talk today on protein engineering of 21st century drugs through the application of synthetic biology. Thank you, Laura, very much for that introduction. And thanks to everybody for coming today. So I'm gonna be talking largely about some work that started uh, back in 2015 uh, when Glyconet uh, funded one of the projects in my group. And this has been a joint project with Steve Withers at the University of British Columbia since that time. I just wanted to start with the acknowledgements because usually you get rushed toward the end and. Uh, you always forget to, to acknowledge the people who have done the work. So uh, Dr. Leanne Sim has been a real uh, driving force for this particular project. And uh, Leanne actually started uh, a postdoc in my lab back in 2014 and then moved on to Steve's lab uh, at the University of British Columbia. So it's been nice to have some continuity with Leanne working on this project in both places. And I have to acknowledge uh, people who did uh, lion's share of this work at Ryerson. So my longtime technician, Nikita Buenbrazo, uh, Saudi Romani, uh, Tasni Mabukar, who just recently left the lab to uh, work with one of our industrial collaborators. So congratulations to her. And Dr. Ting Du, who was a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the group who really kick-started this project back uh, when we started it. Uh, currently here at the University of Alberta, uh, the work is being looked after largely by my technician, Nicole Thompson, and we had some excellent help from two undergraduates, Samar and Leaf, uh, this summer and, and last year. And then, of course, to thank Glyconet for funding this work um, for five years. So, <clears throat> as uh, Lara said in the introduction, we really do specialize in the enzymes that make and, and degrade uh, carbohydrates. And we got interested in um, being able to manipulate glycans for a variety of applications. And I don't have time to talk about all of these things today, but really what I'm gonna tell you about today is uh, our effort to reprogram E. coli using synthetic biology to incorporate a biosynthetic pathway to make a mammalian glycan structure. Um, we also have other projects where we've been working on uh, synthetic small molecules, of course, and we have a project that I hope to talk about one day where we've been looking at tissue regeneration through cell surface uh, modifications using exogenous enzyme treatment. And then uh, we have a nice project uh, where we've been remodeling natural glycans to improve the functionality of therapeutic proteins. So I don't think it's news to anybody that um, approved um, therapeutic proteins are all, almost all glycoproteins. Uh, what surprised me was the size of, of the market. So in, in 2017, the global biologics market was around $209 billion US. That's a gigantic industry. And there are many, many proteins which are being used for a variety of <clears throat> Uh, therapeutic indications, and it made sense to see if we could um, get into that uh, area where we are improving some of these therapeutic proteins, but taking a slightly different approach. So <clears throat> uh, most people tend to think of therapeutic glycoproteins uh, that are being produced these days in, in terms of how long do they hang around to do their job in the body. And we know for sure that the presence of terminal sialic acids 
on these glycoproteins uh, really does in increase their circulatory half-life. And in many cases, when those glycans um, are end-linked glycans, this is to keep the proteins out of the liver receptor, the actual morel receptor or the acyloglycoprotein receptor, which is very good at scavenging proteins that have terminal galactose and uh, filtering them out uh, for degradation. Um, <clears throat> what's a little less clear is whether the sialic acids on O-glycans um, on things like uh, GCSF, which I've highlighted um, with the red uh, check mark there, uh, whether those particular uh, glycans also play a role in keeping them out of, of the, the liver. They tend to be quite small proteins, and these ones are largely filtered uh, in the kidney and not so much captured. So what is the sialic acid doing um, on those um, small cytokine type proteins? Um, <clears throat> right, so we, we've spent uh, a very long time using enzymes in vitro, and, and we know how to synthesize glycans in vitro. Uh, we're, we're very good at making all kinds of different structures, uh, but we realized that um, a real advance in being able to apply glycosyl transferase technology would be to reprogram a bacterium to, to do that job. And that's because when you do this work in vitro, you have to worry about accessory enzymes for converting uh, sugar nucleotides, you have to worry about a source of sugar nucleotides, um, and all of that is kind of expensive, and it would just be easier if you could just use a biosynthetic um, pathway in a particular organism. And so we embarked on this project to see what we could do with reprogramming E. coli to do this job. So the pathway <clears throat> that we are looking at is uh, the core one pathway at the moment which is depicted here. So when I say core one, uh, this is, uh, starts with a Galnac residue and a serine or threonine residue. It's then elongated by the T uh, synthase or the core one synthase, which puts a beta-1,3 galactose on there. And then this can be silated or it can be converted into a different core type. But for the moment, we're just concerned with going down this pathway of making the silyl T and then eventually the disyl T. And it turns out that the, the presence of these O-glycans on cytokines uh, really does help with um, slowing down proteolytic degradation of these things. So this has been documented for interferon alpha series proteins. It's also been documented for GCSF. And so um, our idea here was we wanted to be able to use these core one glycans as a base for further elongation or further modification to aid with this uh, half-life uh, in increasing property that we, uh, we know we can get. So <clears throat> we've started off um, looking at the interferon alpha series. So this is an antiviral protein, which is currently used to treat hepatitis C. It also has some anti-proliferative properties, so it, it can be used uh, in certain cancer uh, scenarios. Uh, we've also been looking at growth factors in particular, human growth factor. Uh, we've also started a couple of projects where we've been um, artificially adding O-glycans to uh, single chain antibodies. And this is more for diagnostic imaging uh, purposes. And I don't have time to, to talk about that today, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to, to uh, talk about that sometime in the future. But it's a, it's, a, it's a nice way of getting into labeling those things for diagnostic imaging. And I don't think anybody really needs to think too hard about why E. coli is a good bioreactor. Anybody who's ever worked with it knows it's got a short growth time. You can get very high biomass yields. It's pretty easy to do genetic manipulation. And uh, you know, in the, in the time it takes to do a transient expression of something like interferon alpha 2b, which is normally about 14 days, um, you can have done 14 different E. coli cultures to achieve the same thing. And so in terms of, of protein production, E. coli is a much more cost-effective way than eukaryotic cell lines. So our first generation target proteins 
are the cytokines uh, that I mentioned, so interferon alpha 2b. But uh, we started off with a fusion protein um, to the B1 domain of protein G, and people will be familiar with protein G as an antibody binding protein from Streptococcus. It turns out that this GB1 domain is actually, even though it's only 56 amino acids long, it's a pretty good folding chaperone for certain classes of proteins. And I just realized I forgot to put the reference in here, but um, I actually found out about this GB1 fusion approach from the NMR literature where people had been using it to fuse domains of proteins that were difficult to look at um, any other way. And uh, it turned out that in our hands, it really does help for the expression. And so at the bottom here, we have the sequence uh, where we've got an N-terminal histag for convenient purification. We have a TEV site, which when cleaved between uh, the glutamine and glycine uh, just prior to the authentic uh, serine terminal would, would leave us with the authentic protein with just one extra amino acid of glycine. Um, should mention that these cytokines are all disulfide bond containing proteins. And so, um, you know, these are not the easiest proteins to express in E. coli, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the other reasons for uh, picking interferon alpha 2b to start with is that the glycosylation site is very well defined and it is naturally glycosylated at that particular site. So we had a way of evaluating um, how well we were going to be able to do compared to naturally uh, produced interferon alpha 2b. So, <clears throat> I mean, we, we really believe that O glycosylation can be engineered. I think. Um, everyone who is familiar with n link glycosylation knows that the asparagine X serine or threonine sequon um, can be manipulated. You can add it to proteins, you can take it out of proteins. Uh, but the O linked uh, for the Galnac initiated um, glycans, that particular sequon is, is much loosely, much more loosely defined. And so what we know is that uh, in the case uh, of this protein here, which is human growth hormone um, sitting on its receptor, there's an unstructured loop. And this unstructured loop is common to the interferon alpha series, interferon gamma series, uh, GCSF. Um, and this particular um, sequence um, has some properties which we know can be manipulated um, to add a sequin, which I, I'm going to tell you about in a minute. So the rules for an O-linked sequin are you really do need to have a proline close by. You can't have any basic or aromatic amino acids, but other than that, the rules are, you know, pretty flexible. So <clears throat> um, these sites tend to occur in flexible loops, and we felt that they represented an opportunity for uh, introduction and optimization. Uh, of an old linked uh, glycosylation site. So <clears throat> we enlisted some software that was developed by Thomas Gerken's lab at um, University of Texas at El Paso called IsoGlyP. And this um, software has been in, in the works for quite a long time. And what it does is it looks at naturally occurring sites and combines uh, information from a large number of uh, synthetic peptide glycosylation experiments with all of the isozymes for the, the polypeptide Galnac uh, family. And what it does is it gives you basically a probability of which isozyme will work on the sequence um, that's at hand. And so we started off knowing that the um, interferon alpha 2b native glycosylation site was this VGVT. And this is preferred by Galnac T1 actually and not Galnac T2. And we wanted to work with Galnac T2 because it's the most promiscuous isozyme in that family. So we, we made a simple modification using the software and we can see that this, the T2 score goes up quite a bit. Um, in the case of our human growth hormone, so that's not naturally glycosylated at this particular site, and the scores would reflect that. 
So we made a simple modification um, to this uh, loop region of HGH, and we were able to show that that's also uh, being used. And um, <clears throat> just to, to show you how we sort of do this, this analysis, this is an HPLC analysis of in vitro reactions where we've been looking at um, taking uh, recombinant GALNAC T1 or GALNAC T2 enzyme and our recombinant interferon alpha 2b or HGH and looking at the modification. So in panel A, this is interferon alpha 2b with um, the enzyme PP GALNAC T2. And um, on the right hand side of the pink trace, you can see unmodified protein. And then uh, to the left of that, you see the amount of GALNAC that's transferred. And I think this is a one hour assay time point. If you look in panel B um, and you look with what happens with GALNAC T1, you can see that it's completely converted in the same time with the same amount of enzyme. And so that really does um, confirm what we see with the ISOVIP scores. And the same thing we see with HGH and then um, the engineered uh, GALNAC-T2 um, site certainly does work with GALNAC-T2, but nothing happens with PP-GALNAC-T1. So we know we were in the right ballpark here. So <clears throat> our approach then for engineering these proteins has been to use a two-plasmid system where we have the target protein on one plasmid, and we have the O-glyc oscillation operon, or OGO for short, on a second plasmid, and we are making these proteins in the cytoplasm of E. coli. So the first generation operon, uh, pretty straightforward. It's got two promoters, and we need two promoters because when we tried to do with just one promoter uh, and four genes, we saw that the, the last two genes are not expressed particularly well. So we just added a second promoter in the middle, so we've got transferase one, in the beginning, <clears throat> then we have the epimerase, which converts UDP GLUCNAC to GALNAC and UDP GLUC to UDP GAL, both of which are not native to E. coli, most strains of E. coli. And then after the second promoter, we have the second transferase. And then we have a protein disulfide isomerase chaperone, which is important for the folding, not only of the target protein, but of the, the eukaryotic transferases that we're expressing. <clears throat> so, um, if we then look at how well this sequon engineering works in vitro, if we look at uh, on the, this particular bar graph, if we look at the native sequence uh, protein expressed with the OGO operon uh, in two different strains of E. coli, we can see from the green bars, which is showing the amount of T antigen, that there's not a lot of modification. Um, but when we modify that sequon in vivo now, and we look at um, yields based on, you know, larger cultures, so in fact, one liter um, cultures, we can get about 80 mg per liter of this fusion protein, about 75% of it, uh, which contains the T antigen. And so, so we knew we were on the right track. Um, but we decided that we needed to understand how this sequon change worked. And so uh, we, we took a little break to um, look at uh, what was happening kinetically. So if we did enzyme kinetics using our HPLC-based assay, which is depicted here, where we just have a titration of target protein and calculate kinetic parameters, what, what is this sequon change actually doing? And we decided that we should look at some other orthologs of the PP GALNAC T2. Um, two others have been described in the literature as being uh, pretty comparable in terms of activity towards similar kinds of sequence. So we looked at human versus Drosophila versus uh, Cena reptides. And <clears throat> what we were able to, to see is that not surprisingly with interferon alpha 2b, with the natural protein that the blue line here in the graph in the middle, um, the human enzyme certainly has the best rate. Um, but when we, when we engineered that sequon, if you look at the, the graph on the right-hand side of the slide, 
what we see is A, that the rate goes up tremendously for all of the enzymes and that the human enzyme is no longer the fastest, if you will. And so th this was very interesting to us. And so we looked at all the kinetic parameters and I'm not gonna walk through this table, but suffice it to say that the sequon mutation um, in two cases here decreases the KM and we get you know, a pretty significant rate increase. So we're looking at about a 17 fold rate increase um, for an in vitro reaction with the human enzyme and a 25 fold for the Cenorhabditis enzyme. Um, but the Drosophila enzyme actually gets about a 200 fold rate increase, which is a spectacular increase for just changing those three amino acids. So clearly the different uh, isozymes um, really do recognize this sequon and it really does result in a, a significant rate enhancement. So what about pushing the sequon design? Um, you know, how far can you go? We, we played with the IsoGlyP software uh, and we made a series of, you know, just educated guesses, adding a, an amino acid to make this sequon work slightly better. And we get this increased um, uh, score, but does it work? And so very preliminary data that we got really li literally a couple of weeks ago. Um, if we look at the purified, this is from HGH now. If we look at human growth hormone version two, three, and four, purified now um, it, from a strain which has that same OGO operon, and then we look for terminal galactose by tagging it with a fluorescent sialic acid, we can see at least preliminary evidence that the higher the isoglyp score for T2, the more sialic acid labeling we get. So, so we're on our way here with being able to manipulate this um, even further. All right, um, I, so our second generation for these kinds of modifications, of course, is now being able to put sialic acid onto these proteins. And so the operon has been expanded. Uh, so we now have four glycosyl transferases. So two silo transferases, um, still the, the pp galnac t and the GAL-T, um, still the same epimerase and protein disulfide isomerase, but of course now the gene arrangement has been changed and we're, we're still playing around with the, the gene order here to try to make everything work as well as, as possible. But we've integrated the biosynthetic pathway for CMP sialic acid um, so that we didn't have to put that on a plasmid as well. We still have the two plasmid system and does it work? Um, and the answer is, yeah, it works actually very well. And so <clears throat> we'll start on the, the right-hand side of the slide here. So the interferon alpha 2b, the engineered version that we have, is almost completely disilated in this particular um, strain. Uh, we get a little bit of monosialic acid. There's virtually no T antigen left. And so we think that um, the sialic acid addition is driving the equilibrium to to make this uh, complete modification. And even HGH, which we know was only getting partially glycosylated uh, with the original OGO operon, is actually mostly, again, disilated. There's a little bit of the intermediates and a little bit of unmodified protein, but we're, we're confident that the new sequon uh, mutation might help us out in that regard. So, so bottom line, um, the addition of the sialotransferase is the sialic acid biosynthesis pathway certainly works and we're in the process of, of optimizing that and, and writing up this, uh, this work. Um, one caveat that I need to mention here is that, you know, these engineered proteins um, now fit into a category that would be considered biobetters. And uh, for those of you who don't know how uh, biologics are evaluated, uh, biosimilar is something that's you know, identical to the natural product. A biobetter is something that you are claiming is better than the natural sequence. And that needs a lot more testing than a biosimilar would. And because we've actually changed the amino acid sequence of these things, uh, we are gonna have to do a little bit more biological testing 
we know that in vitro, all of the proteins that we're making are, are nice and active, at least in, in tissue culture, but um, these new loop uh, glycosylation, new loops and the glycosylation are not normal for these particular proteins. And so uh, the burden of, of proof is on us now to show that these proteins really are um, going to be worth testing at some point. So <clears throat> um, our follow-up work then, uh, we are certainly looking at more target proteins, so things in the interferon series and other proteins that I mentioned. We're also looking into changing um, different uh, to different uh, O-glycan core types, so core two, three, and four, because these have the potential for longer chains and, and branching. And we've been playing around with this idea of what we call a sequon tag, where we actually then can have multiple sites of glycan modification on a single protein. And we're still working on trying to put more of the genes into the genome of E. coli to decrease the metabolic burden that the cell has to deal with by having 10 genes on two different plasmids that need to be coordinately um, regulated. So um, hopefully, you know, in the near future, we'll have um, a few more targets out there and, and we'll be confident about, um, you know, the variety of different O core types that we can make. And so um, that's all I had to say um, for science-wise, um, but I just wanted to say, you know, can COVID-19 please finish up so that my group can actually now take a new group photo? And I'll, I'll stop there and I'll take some questions. <laughs>